on the uh, dichotomy of control like Epictetus talks about or the, the serenity prayer yeah. found in Christianity, I can kind of accept that there are things outside of my control and I can I can work and practice the serenity of letting go of those things. Like, yeah. you know, if the universe explodes tomorrow, I can't control that. Nope. And I find serenity in that. So that's mm -hmm. work, but that practice seems very reasonable to me. I can work on my courageousness to try to take up those things that I can control. Mm -hmm. And whether it's being a better son or a better husband, I can control those things and I can I can accept that I should work on that and that I have that within my control. It's the wisdom to understand what hmm. is and isn't that to me feels like the greatest task. And I'm curious how I can create a framework to understand what is and isn't because there's some things that I feel like are in my control that may not be. So yeah. for example, like outcome oriented thinking. Yeah. Uh, I spoke recently with a retired uh, NBA player. He played many years uh, in the NBA playing basketball. And I asked him a question about creating goals and visualizing the future. And he made a comment that was very stoic. That was interesting. Mm. He says, I haven't set a goal for myself since I was 16 years old. Hmm. And at this, this point, he was you know almost 40. And I asked why. And he said, because I have no control over those goals. Very nice. He said, I can only control what I do. I can only control how much I practice, how yep. frequently I practice, how well I take care of my body, but I can't control if I win a national championship. Correct. So I'm not going to make that a goal. I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. But yeah, my He's definitely a stoic. <laughs> yeah, whether he knows it or not. <laughs> right. So my question is, how can I divorce myself from the outcome when the outcome of things feels very much within my control? Well, as your basketball player said, it's actually not under your control. And therefore, it's a question of recognizing. Remember, the, we talked about the cognitive verse and then the behavioral step, right? Mm -hmm. The cognitive step is, is the first one. Uh, one of the major issues with control, with the, the notion of control, is that a lot of people seem to uh, you know, think that things are under their control, that they're not. Uh, and... The first realization in Stoicism is that there's very little that you actually control. In fact, there is only one thing that you control at the end of the day. I mentioned three earlier because that's what Epictetus does. He mentions three in, at the beginning of the, the manual. He says, and these three things are your judgments about situations, your decisions to act or not to act, and the values that you endorse or reject. So values and these values, right? But if you think about it, they all come down to judgments. Judgments, obviously, are judgments, but so by definition. Decisions to act or not to act are judgments because if you decide to act, mm -hmm. you 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 have arrived at the judgment that this is a situation where you right. need to act. This is the practice of judgment. Right. And then the values and these values are also judgments. If you say to yourself, these are the things that I value, these are the things that I don't value, that those are judgments as well. So at the end of the day, the only thing, according to what that you control is your judgment. Judgment, That's judgment, it. and judgment. Right, it's judgment, judgment, judgment. And as the basketball player was saying, you control your intentions, which is another way to say your judgments. You do not control your outcomes. So if you think of it in terms of that dichotomy, sometimes modern Stoics refer to that as the dichotomy of control, as in there's two things only, and only two things. What people have trouble with, in my experience, is that then they say, well, but it's not a dichotomy, is it? There are a bunch of things that I influence. I do not fully control, but I influence. And the answer there is, no, it's, there, there is no such a thing. Whatever you think of as influencing is still the result of two components, one of which is your intentions, and the other one is the outcomes. Mm -hmm. The example of the basketball player is a perfect one. So as he says, what do I control? my decisions to practice, my decision to do this or that or the other. What I don't control, the outcome, whether I win a, a game or I win a championship. Can I influence the chances of winning a game or a championship? Yes, but how does that influence work? That influence is the result of his decisions to act in a certain way, and then the fa what, what other people and other circumstances do or don't do. So every time we think about influencing something, what you're really saying is there are two components here going on. One that is up to me, my intentions, and one is not up to me, all the external factors.
To influence simply means to translate your judgments into action. That's what an influence is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a good tennis player, let's say, uh, influences the outcome of the game by deciding to act in certain ways. That's it. Then the outcome of the game, of course, depends on the combination of what he actually does plus what his opponent does plus what the referee does and plus random things like the ball spinning one way or, or, or the other. All of those other things are not under his control. He doesn't control his opponent. He doesn't control the referee. He doesn't control the ball. Hmm. The only thing that he controls and therefore the way he influences the game is through his decision to act in a certain way or not, to hit the ball in a, with a certain angle or not, to respond to move in a certain direction or not, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, hypothetically, in the tennis example, let's say there's doubles tennis. Mm -hmm. Now, the proper way to play tennis, like we talk about the playing the game masterfully or playing the game skillfully is what you should be striving to do as an athlete or someone yep. playing some type of sport. To play the game masterfully would be to playing it the proper way. Right. Now, what if there's an improper way that is not explicitly stated, it's not cheating, mm -hmm. but you know, targeting the weaker player? Every time the ball comes to you, you're going to hit it to the weaker player. Yeah. I don't know if this would be a beautiful way to play the game. I don't know if this would be a virtuous way to play the game because you're trying to exploit a weakness. But it would increase your chances of winning. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if if that yeah. example would apply. I have another example that might be useful. Well, let's take for, with this one for a second, and then we'll move to the next one. Uh, remember, one of the three things that Epictetus says are up to you is your values, right? And these values. So what's your value? Is your value that winning is important no matter how you win within the rules? If you're cheating, that's it. That of course, yeah. It's out we of the question, right? can accept cheating is a violation. Right. Uh, but within the boundaries of not cheating, then it's 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 up to you. It's it's you have to make a decision about your values. Is your value that you don't just want to win; you also want to play beautifully, or is your value that you you know whatever it, whatever it takes within the limits of what is actually allowed, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Stoics would would blame you one way or the other. It's like okay, that's those are your values. Uh, there are some people who say no, I don't want to just do just to win. I want to win in style. I mm. want to win in a way that it's beautiful. It's, I want to have uh, aesthetic appreciation of the component of my game. I don't want that, this to be a, an ugly game. Interesting. Right? So, okay, fine. That's your value. Like trash talking, for example. Yeah. So Marco Mas Maserati, 2006 yeah. World Cup against France. He's trash talking Zinedine Zidane. Yep. Zinedine Zidane gets angry. He headbutts yep. him. He gets ejected from the game. It goes to a penalty shootout. And Zinedine Zidane can't take a penalty kick despite being one of the greatest penalty kick takers on the team and in the world at the time. And as a result, France loses the game. And Italy's, you still can't get over and it. And I can't get over it, <laughs> Massimo. I'm still frustrated. I cry. I'm just a boy, okay? <laughs> but my question is, the Italians, Mar Maserati, in that moment, used a tactic that's not illegal. It's, it's, not, it's not against the rules to talk trash. Obviously, Correct. within a limit, he was, I don't think he was being racist or, or prejudicial no. in some way. No. So I don't think he broke a rule. And he just pushed the right button. He pushed the right button, <laughs> and as a result, he won the game. Right. So, from a stoic perspective, this would just come down to what his value set is. Correct. And I think that um, from a stoic perspective, I think both of them made a mistake there. Hmm. Right. So, the Italian player made a mistake of, although he was technically within the rules, it clearly was not a virtuous thing to do, right? To, 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 to go to an opponent into losing their, their temper. Right. I mean, by, according to your virtues. Of, well, um, no. According, remember, the virtues are supposed to be universal. Mm -hmm. uh, if you buy into the Stoic system, you think that those are universal. And one of the, the, the major goals, remember, is to be pro-social. Mm -hmm. You're not being pro-social if you are goading somebody into becoming angry hmm. uh, as in, you know, in, by, by insulting their girlfriend or sister or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? So one could argue that is not a virtuous behavior. It's technically okay. It did, as you said, it didn't break any rules. But are you actually, you know, think of it this way. Are you really proud of that? You know, when you go home, you say, hey, I won because I got the other guy upset. It's like, eh, hmm. On the other hand, the French 
player also did something that from a stoic perspective is question. You got angry. Right, that seems much more clear to me. Yeah, right. So he should have just shrugged his shoulders, turned around and and kicked the penalty and, and focused on, on the game. So they both made... Uh, you know, engaged in a way that was not exactly the, the the best way. That said, that's what human experience is about, right? And you you learn. I'm, I'm sure they, that that Zidane actually learned that you know the next time around you don't react that way, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that. right. It's it's like oh, that's an experience that you don't forget. Losing the World Cup <laughs> as yeah. a result of getting angry uh, surely is something that tells you that getting angry might be problematic, right?